2004, the Cassini space probe approaches the ringed planet Saturn and its 56 moons. It discovers something almost unimaginable, conditions that might support life. And if those conditions could exist so close by, what might we find in the next galaxy? On a planet just like Earth. For millennia, we humans have looked to the skies and wondered whether we're alone in the universe. Today, we're closer than ever to knowing the answer. Some scientists believe we'll get our first look at our extraterrestrial cousins in the near future. I hope it's in the next 10 years, and I'm ready for it next week. So, <laughs> the sooner the better. What's more, we could find these aliens not on distant planets in unexplored galaxies, but right next door in our own solar system. Scientists are now honing in on proof that ET is out there and living on the most hazardous of worlds. Our safari will journey to seven destinations in our solar system to see just where these creatures could be and what they might look like. These exotic lands are unimaginably harsh. Life as we think of it would perish in an instant. But alien life may be far tougher than we expect as we're learning from a surprising group of living things right here on Earth. Until just a few decades ago, we were sure our planet was unique. It is the only one we've found so far that has nurtured the evolution of millions of species. Thanks to its abundant sunshine, warm water, and protective atmosphere. We logically concluded that life needed each of those things, a conclusion that ruled out all other known worlds in our solar system. But then, biologists began combing some of the Earth's darkest and coldest places. And to their surprise, they found living, breathing creatures. Biologists call these organisms extremophiles. Some don't need light or oxygen. Others survive in tremendous atmospheric pressure. It seems life can turn up practically anywhere. Take Antarctica. After years of searching this arid, frozen landscape, scientists doubted they'd find anything alive. But in 1999, a team of explorers unearthed a rock from six feet under the ice. What they found amazed them. When they cracked the rock open, they found it teeming with tiny creatures. Here, at temperatures of 68 degrees below zero and six feet under solid ice, life had found a foothold. Biologists have been increasingly discovering life, not kangaroos, but, you know, simpler forms of life that live at very cold temperatures, very high temperatures, very great pressures, even in places where there's sort of a high degree of radiation. It turns out life is able to live in a much wider variety of environments on our own planet than we used to think. And if life can survive extreme conditions, not just here at home, but elsewhere in our solar system, think of what this could mean. Unless there's something extraordinarily miraculous about our solar system or our planet, then life has got to be extremely commonplace. I mean, there's got to be large numbers of worlds with life. And some of them would have cooked up intelligent life. In the beginning, our Earth was as deadly a planet as any. A 
Over the first billion years of Earth's existence, cosmic debris pummeled it mercilessly. The impacts turned its surface into a broiling, seething inferno where life was impossible. But once the solar system settled down and the Earth began to cool, water appeared, setting the stage for life. In 1953, researcher Stanley Miller proved in a lab experiment just how easily life on Earth got its start. He combined water with hydrogen, methane and ammonia, components of the Earth's early atmosphere. Then he zapped his solution with an electric charge to simulate lightning. His results shocked the world. Miller had created organic molecules called amino acids, the protein building blocks of all living things. If lightning helped jumpstart life on Earth, could it have done the same on other planets? Galactic probes have now found the ingredients in Miller's experiment throughout our solar system, including one essential to life. One of the requirements that every form of life that we know about on Earth has, every single one, is liquid water. We've used evidence for liquid water to kind of guide our search for habitable environments. Our safari is headed to seven worlds, some possibly rich in water, where scientists believe aliens might be hiding. While any life there might have begun much like life on Earth, how it looks now is anyone's guess. We begin in the world that has always fired our imaginations, the planet right next door, Mars. Of all the planets where we've looked for life, it's the one we've studied most. The scientist who may get the first look at Martians, if they're found, is Steve Squires, principal investigator for NASA's Mars rovers. Mars has always had, among all the planets, I think a special fascination for, for humans. For a very long time, we've known enough about Mars to know that it is probably the most Earth-like. It may be the most like Earth, with an atmosphere and seasons, but we humans would perish quickly on Mars. Its air is thin, 40 times thinner than the air at the top of Mount Everest. And it sits in a bad neighborhood of our solar system, near an asteroid belt. Its atmosphere is too flimsy to protect it. Asteroids continually bombard its surface. Violent winds can whip Mars's sandy soil into storms that consume the entire planet for weeks and spawn tornadoes eight kilometers high. Midday temperatures at the equator of one degree Celsius fall to minus 70 at night. David Grinspoon is a curator of astrobiology at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. As he sees it, Mars would be warmer if it wasn't a planetary runt. When I grab coffee on a cold morning, I know that a small espresso is going to cool off quickly, whereas a larger coffee is going to stay warm much longer. Large objects stay warm longer because their interiors are shielded from the outside where the cooling occurs. And planets are exactly the same way. A small planet will cool off early in its history. A larger planet like Earth will stay warm for billions of years, which makes it a better place probably to look for life. Despite Mars's drawbacks, it has always fascinated scientists because its terrain seemed to give evidence that it might support life. Its dynamic landscape of mountains, volcanoes and deep ravines is not unlike our Earth. To early astronomers, these features look like oceans and rivers and even a system of canals, supposedly not just supporting life, but actually produced by it. Percival Lowell in the United States uh, observed these things and inferred that, in fact, these were, things were so straight 
and so regular in geometry that they had to have been the product of intelligent life. Okay, well he was right, the problem was the life was at the wrong end of the telescope. In viewing this thing visually through a telescope eyepiece, the, the human eye-brain combination started to connect things that weren't really there. Lowell was not alone. Some scientists were shocked when the probe Viking 1 beamed back this image. Is that a human face? Perhaps produced by Martians in their own likeness? Until recently, we've never really known where to look in our solar system for extraterrestrial life. But we've always known what the aliens would be like once we found them. Consciousness. I was on a table. Usually, there is more than a hint of the Earthling in our aliens. Hostile or lovable, they tend to resemble mutant images of ourselves. As a senior astronomer at the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute in California, Seth Shostak has spent his career listening for the radio waves of a distant alien society. There's no reason to assume that they're going to look like us or even think like us or behave like us or have language. You know, you just have to look at the variety of life on Earth and you see that, you know, nature can come up with lots of different forms. But if there is life on Mars, how could it survive in such extreme conditions? Since the 1960s, scientists have sent dozens of probes to the Red Planet. The first pictures of the barren landscape quickly dashed any hope of finding intelligent beings. But what scientists did see startled them. Though there's no evidence of Martian-made canals, there are signs that Mars actually may have had water. Some think the angry red planet might once have been blue. You just have to look back a couple of billion years, three and a half billion, four billion years ago, Mars had a thicker atmosphere, had water on its surface, clearly, maybe it developed life. And as it slowly went bad, you know, the life had to adapt. Life may have adapted, not died off, because some liquid water may still exist underground. But with no surface water, frigid temperatures, and ultra-thin atmosphere, Mars is a planet only one kind of creature could love, an extremophile. Extremophiles thrive in the cruelest of places. To see where they might lurk on Mars, we head to the Valles Marineris, a massive rift in Mars's surface, 20 times wider than the Grand Canyon in places, and almost as deep as Mount Everest is tall. Lakes may have once flooded this valley, and those lakes could have hosted life. As the water dried up, life could have evolved to cope with the harsher environment. We won't know what these extremophiles are like until we find them. But they may resemble creatures that exist in extreme places right here on Earth. An unusual team of biologists, called astrobiologists, study Earth for the kinds of life we may find in outer space. Astrobiologist Rocco Mancinelli is on the hunt for Mars's extremophiles. If it went beneath the surface, and some of it undoubtedly did, then what happened to it? Well, it formed brine pockets. So what kind of organism can live in a salty brine? A salt-loving organism. Astrobiologist Chris McKay thinks he knows the kind of salt-loving creatures that might survive on Mars. Creatures much like those he's found in one of the driest, saltiest places on Earth. The fundamental challenge to life on Mars is, in a sense, the fundamental challenge of life here in Death Valley, its dryness. That is the hardest thing for life to adapt to. Thousands of years ago, a salty lake covered Death Valley just as lakes filled Mars's mariner trench. Moving 
this is this is still wet, a little wet. This appears like a lifeless place, a big flat white empty horizon. But yet just below the surface, we find layers of algae and bacteria growing. They're living in a an environment that in many ways is fundamentally different from the environment that we sense on the surface. Here you're in a place which looks lifeless, looks dead, and yet you dig down and hidden underneath, there it is. Beneath the salt is a layer of hardy green algae that survive on the water and light that trickle through. The algae in turn feed salt-loving microorganisms. Here in deserts on Earth, dried, salty lake beds, we're going to find them on Mars as well. Salty deserts are not the only places life might be hiding on the red planet. There are Mars's tremendous volcanoes, some of them six times larger than those on Earth. Astrobiologist Penny Boston studies the caves, called lava tubes, left over after volcanic lava has dissipated. Not long ago, we assumed caves like these were devoid of life. They get no sunlight, and no sunlight means no photosynthesis. But in lava tubes outside Albuquerque, New Mexico, Boston has found evidence of extreme life. Because we know Mars has many, many lava tubes. And so here we have the opportunity to see how these formed and also to look at the life that inhabits them. The extremophiles Boston has found appear to be thriving. They get their energy by feeding on the minerals in the cave wall. So here we're up close to the wall and you can see these white patches here growing against the black basalt. And each one of these is like a major city for these little guys. They're, you know, they're all nestled in these little pockets in the basalt. And so these guys are permanently adapted to these freezing temperatures. Uh, they never see any light and they get uh, what they can find in the environment. Are there creatures like these in the caves below Mars's volcano fields? Boston thinks so. We are going to find life, and I just hope that I live a long and healthy life so that I can still be around to see that. We may already have had our first glimpse of Martians, not from our visit to their planet, but from their visit to ours. 16 million years ago, an asteroid slammed into Mars and propelled a two kilogram rock into space. Amazingly, that rock sailed to Earth and came to rest in Antarctica. Inside, NASA scientist David McKay and Everett Gibson were amazed to spot the outlines of fossils. Water has carved small tunnels in the rock. And in these tunnels, McKay and Gibson found what they believe to be evidence of bacterial life. These are little microbes, and they're dead, and they're, they're fossils, or in some cases, we don't even see the forms. We see the footprints or the evidence that they were there. Life from Mars? Maybe. The hunt is only just beginning. NASA plans to send a rover called Phoenix to Mars. It will study the planet's ice cap and probe three feet beneath the surface. NASA even has a plan to send human visitors. They may not meet the little green men of our imaginations, but they could encounter life in some form. What will it look like? It is likely to be a subterranean dweller with an ability to survive on little water. Perhaps an organism with a taste for minerals like the creatures in the lava tubes of New Mexico. Even the smallest find would have enormous implications. Proof that life is not unique to Earth, but exists just next door.
Our safari to the places in our solar system likely to harbor alien life now takes us past the asteroid belt on the far side of Mars. Here, Jupiter reigns. But this planet, the largest in our solar system, is fairly hostile to life, thanks to its toxic gases and overpowering gravity. Not only is it pretty cold out at Jupiter, uh, it's also, you know, it's got this really thick atmosphere, tens of thousands of miles thick, and it's got ammonia and methane and, you know, things used to clean the bathroom. But Jupiter has more than 60 moons that we know about. At first glance, those moons would seem unlikely places to seek alien life. Their atmospheres are thin and they are inhumanly cold. The temperature on Callisto is lower than minus 200 degrees Celsius. The scientific probes Voyager and Galileo have detected little on the surface of these moons but ice, with one dramatic exception. Io is one of the closest moons to Jupiter. When NASA sent Voyager 1 to Io in 1979, Astronomers were astonished to find its surface roiling with giant volcanoes. Io is the most volcanically active place in the solar system, just spewing volcanic material from its surface all the time. What could be heating the interior of this frigid moon? Amazingly, it's the force of gravity from Jupiter. The giant planet exerts enormous gravitational pull on its moons. The closer the moon, the stronger the force. So strong, it can actually stretch their crusts. But some of these moons have elliptical orbits, so as they near Jupiter, the crust stretches towards it. When they move further away, the crust relaxes back towards spherical. This constant tidal movement creates friction deep inside, and that friction generates heat. It's like rubbing two sticks together to start a fire. The pull of Jupiter is heating Io from the inside out. Volcanic fumes and lack of water make Io inhospitable to life. But Jupiter's other large moons are more distant close enough for Jupiter's gravity to warm them from within, but distant enough to remain calm on the surface. Three of them look particularly promising as possible homes for alien life. The one furthest from the giant planet, Callisto. On its surface, Callisto looks like our moon, scarred and cratered by countless hits from asteroids. Those impacts may have melted the surface ice for brief periods, allowing life to take hold. But in 1998, the Galileo spacecraft detected a much more promising incubator deep beneath Callisto's surface. Radioactive rocks and tremendous pressure in its core generate heat inside Callisto. The heat may be melting its icy crust from below, creating a hidden ocean. And hidden oceans could mean hidden life. As we fly closer to Jupiter, we find its largest moon, Ganymede. Ganymede is also deeply scarred. Ridges rise above its surface. Those bright spots are craters as big as five kilometers across and likely to be lined with frost. But these photos offer the most compelling clues to where life here might hide. They show flowing glaciers. Glaciers that resemble those on Earth. Ganymede's moving glaciers could also be signs of heat within. So, like Callisto, Ganymede could also have a hidden ocean, buried beneath as much as 190 kilometers of ice. 
The third moon on this leg of our alien safari is the most intriguing. It is called Europa, and of the three, it resides closest to Jupiter. That proximity to the giant planet means Europa's core may be very hot, far hotter than Callisto's or Ganymede's. But its surface remains frigid, a potent combination for life, since there could be a temperate zone where they meet. Mammoth fissures scar Europa's thick crust of ice, a sign that ice is always shifting. On our own planet, we see the same cracks in the ice sheets covering the Arctic Ocean. Europa's crust may be riding the largest ocean in the solar system, an ocean twice as large as all of Earth's put together. Now those oceans, if they're there, and the chances are pretty good that at least some of them are, uh, they've been sitting around for a long time, four billion years, a little longer, right? In four billion years, an ocean of water, do you think anything might have cooked up there? Well, it certainly seems plausible. The environment on, in Europa's ocean is, is more or less as nice as the environment in our own ocean, as a place for, for living things to exist. Heck, things from planet Earth could probably live in the European Ocean. But Europa's oceans would be very cold, even slushy. And sunlight never penetrates them, thanks to an icy cover that may be 16 kilometers thick. We might never have thought life could exist here if not for a revolutionary discovery off the coast of Ecuador. Deep in the Pacific, biologists have found flourishing communities of tube worms, crabs, and even squid. These creatures are thriving despite complete darkness, extreme cold, and the pressure of the deep ocean. They feed on bacteria that take their energy not from the sun, but from chemicals erupting from the sea floor. We might find very similar volcanic vents on Europa, supporting their own web of life. To find out, NASA scientists would like to put a lander on the European surface. Some would like to send a cryobot, a robot that would melt the ice and release a probe into the liquid below. That's not so hard to do, you just have to melt your way through. But you're going to have to melt your way through not a couple hundred feet, but a, maybe a, a dozen miles of ice and send down a, uh, a fishing line with a, uh, maybe a video camera and a light bulb on it and look around. In all that water, we can't rule out the possibility that very simple life forms have evolved further. We might even find creatures as advanced as some here at home. Most likely, however, we would find microbes. But even that would be a sea change in how we view the birth and growth of life. Europa was warm. What if a place is one of the coldest known? Or if its lakes flow with toxic chemicals instead of water? These are the worlds we find as our safari continues even deeper into space. As our safari in search of alien life sweeps by the ringed planet, Saturn, we can see the violently swirling gases that choke its atmosphere. We can also feel Saturn's gravity, weaker than Jupiter's, but still formidable. We'll keep moving. We're not likely to find living things here. Saturn's rings are also extremely inhospitable. They're made of rock and ice, as small as a grain of sugar or as big as a house. But Saturn has many moons, 56 that we've spotted so far. Our safari heads first to one of those moons, a tiny frigid satellite called Enceladus, just 500 kilometers in diameter. Here, gravity is very weak, a fraction of that on Earth and Enceladus has hardly any atmosphere. It reflects back into space almost all the sunlight that hits it, making it the shiniest object in our solar system. 
Until very recently, we also thought Enceladus was too cold to support life. It appears we were wrong. In 2005, after a seven-year journey, the Cassini spacecraft approached the tiny moon and detected something that stunned the mission's principal investigator, Caroline Porco. So th this was the picture that just, you know, grabbed us. Just was shocking. Those are plumes made of water from a geyser. The geyser's steam and hot water hit the cold vacuum of space and explode into a jet of ice. With little gravity to rein it in, the ice cloud can grow as big as Enceladus itself. Porco has never seen anything like it anywhere else. It's like a planetary explorer's dream to come upon a body like Enceladus. Those jets, those fountains, if you will, just spewing vapor and icy snow hundreds of kilometers above the south pole of Enceladus. There's only one conclusion. Tiny, frigid Enceladus is piping hot within. Like Jupiter, Saturn's giant gravitational field tugs on its satellites, creating friction and heat within. As far as we can tell now, it seems like an inescapable conclusion that there may be liquid water deeper down on Enceladus because it's warm. And the best models we can put forth right now to even explain the warmth, much less the jets, seem to indicate that you would get temperatures warm enough to melt water. Heat, liquid water, even the furthest reaches of our solar system may contain the chemistry for life. What kind of creature could live in the steamy waters of a geyser? Thanks to hot springs back on Earth, we have some idea. At one point, we assumed nothing lived in the steam-driven fountains of Yellowstone National Park. But then, biologists discovered microbes in these waters. Microbes that feed on chemicals dissolved in the water. Today, we call them thermophiles. The hardiest can thrive in boiling water. Could there be thermophiles on Enceladus? To find out, our safari takes us in for a close-up of this extraterrestrial old faithful. It's too cold for anything to live near the surface, but temperatures there are minus 165 degrees Celsius. But what about the hot water inside? In the ice plume above Enceladus, Cassini's probes have found carbon dioxide and methane, chemicals that could feed life below. Just as the chemical-laden springs of Yellowstone feed microbes living there. We have a body that um, very, very likely has liquid water in its interior, has shown us already it's got simple organic compounds and, um, you know, a whole host of things that make it, I think, a major body of astrobiological interest in our solar system. If Enceladus has been a shock, astronomers have been astounded by another of Saturn's moons, Titan. It may be the unlikeliest to harbor life. Titan gets only a limited amount of sunlight, about a thousandth as much as Earth. Probes sent to Titan have detected ice, but no liquid water. And at temperatures of minus 138 degrees Celsius, that ice is hard as stone. What could possibly make Titan a promising environment for alien life? Remarkably, Titan in many ways resembles the Earth, but not the one we know now. Titan has turned out to be the body fantastic in the Saturn system, which is long suspected of having an environment at the surface, not only similar to the kind of environment we find here on Earth, even, believe it or not, similar to the kind of environment we had on Earth before the emergence of life. Titan intrigued Carolyn and Porco's team so much, they directed the Cassini spacecraft to send a probe there in 2005. It was the most distant surface mission ever conducted. 
the probe saw just ridges and plains. But a later flyover by Cassini spotted a shoreline. Soon, thousands of lakes came into view, at least one bigger than the Great Lakes of North America. It's the first time we've ever detected liquid on the surface of another celestial body. Kind of looks like Minnesota, except the lakes are not water, they're, they're liquid natural gas. But liquid natural gas is a liquid. And that's not snow. Those are methane flakes. Like Earth, Titan has weather. But it's of a rather psychedelic kind. There are even methane hurricanes. It's not water, it's methane doing all the exact same things. Raining, evaporating, flowing in rivers. So you have something that, that is basically doing what water does on Earth, on Titan, only it's methane. A similar scene may have existed on Earth four billion years ago, making scientists suspect that Titan could also be an incubator for life. Chemistry does go on. At those cold temperatures, it's really slow. But Titan has had four billion years in which to do some chemistry, and maybe in that period of time, maybe something is cooked up. It would have to cook up without liquid water, something we've never seen before. But scientists aren't ruling it out. The substitute could be the methane, so abundant on Titan. Used for fuel on Earth, methane was long thought poisonous to all life. But in 1997, researchers examined mounds of methane ice in the Gulf of Mexico, and they were astonished to find colonies of small centipede-like worms thriving amid the frozen substance. They think the worms may eat bacteria that feed on the methane. In general, um, things that we think of as deadly, many of them are potentially lively. If you can figure out an evolutionary way to tap into that energy rather than having it destroy you, then it can be bountiful. There could be one more complication for life on the surface of Titan. With only a weak magnetic field to shield it, living things on the surface could be exposed to cosmic radiation. But that might not be a problem for an extremophile, as we found here on Earth. Biologists have uncovered plenty of life near Chernobyl's contaminated nuclear reactor. And even swimming in toxic radioactive spills, actually feeding off the decaying molecules. It's possible Titan's life forms could do the same. To find life on Titan, we may have to dive into its methane lakes, where we might find chemical loving bacteria. We may even find microbes resistant to radiation, not unlike those here on Earth at Chernobyl, living on its rock hard ice sheets. Organisms that eat methane might give off heat, melting the ice, possibly creating another fountain for life. There's no doubt, life on Titan would be a strange brew. But we have yet to visit the most bizarre world where scientists believe life could exist. And it's much closer to home. Our safari of the world's most likely to harbor alien life has taken us far. We've visited frigid deserts, submerged oceans, and methane lakes. But the world we are about to visit may be the most extreme of all. For our final stop, we are turning back toward Earth, to Venus, our closest planetary neighbor in the solar system. If life can survive here, it seems it could exist almost everywhere. To reach the surface of Venus, we have to fly through a dense layer of yellow clouds, 64 kilometers deep, with a composition similar to battery acid. The atmosphere here is 90 times heavier than Earth's, too heavy for a human to tolerate. On the ground, there are extinct volcanoes and lava flows as far as the eye can see. 
They cover 85% of the planet's surface. It is hard to believe Venus once had vast oceans. You basically had a runaway greenhouse effect where uh, as it starts to get warmer, the oceans start to evaporate, and then that puts water vapor in the air. Well, water vapor is a potent greenhouse gas, so that's what leads to the runaway. The oceans basically boil off, and then the CO2 all ends up in the atmosphere, and so today you have this very hot, hyper greenhouse planet. With temperatures around 460 degrees Celsius, Venus is even hotter than Mercury, the planet closest to the sun not a surface hospitable to life. Life as we know it cannot exist on the surface of Venus because organic molecules would just be ripped to shreds by, by the hot gases. But we've stopped here, not because of what's on the ground, but what's in the air. In 1982, the Soviet spacecraft Venera 14 visited Venus. In the clouds, 50 kilometers up, it detected temperatures much cooler than on the surface. What's more, it found the molecules so critical for life, H2O. So far, every bit of water we've found beyond Earth is frozen solid. Only in the clouds above Venus have we found it in vapor form, a possible incubator for life. But Venus's clouds are also filled with highly acidic sulfur. Once, we thought nothing could live in sulfur. But scientists have analyzed some of the most acidic water on Earth, leaching from a California mine. Watch your hand, sulfuric acid. In sulfuric acids strong enough to erode metal, eat through clothing, and dissolve human flesh, they found life, acid-loving extremophiles. These organisms feed on sulfur compounds, like iron sulfide, eating the iron and emitting the highly acidic sulfur. Do extremophiles like these float above Venus? Astrobiologist David Grinspoon likes to think it's possible. Maybe in the clouds of Venus there are some sulfur-based organisms. Sulfur actually absorbs ultraviolet light in interesting ways, and I'm just imagining that there's some, maybe some kind of photochemical um, reaction going on where uh, ultraviolet light is actually being used to convert chemicals into some higher energy state, which then is, is basically being eaten. What will these aliens be like if we do find them? They would have to tolerate high temperatures and enormous atmospheric pressure. They would also need to thrive in acid concentrations, deadly to most life forms. Perhaps they might resemble a hardier version of the acid-resistant extremophiles in California's mine. We keep finding that life lives in places that we used to think were inhospitable. So whenever we say, oh, it's impossible, you couldn't have life in the clouds of Venus, I think we have to be very careful because they might just reflect our own ignorance or our uh, limitations on our own imagination and maybe not real limitations on the, the ultimate creativity of nature, which seems to find solutions to these problems. As our safari returns to the cool, blue, lush and lively world of Earth, we can see why we so revere its life-sustaining gifts. But, as we are learning, even the most extreme environments can harbor living things. Extremophiles may resemble the first version of life in our universe, and they could even be the most common. Could they have evolved further from these humble beginnings? Could intelligent life be out there as well? For more than 40 years, scientists at the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence Institute in California have been searching the skies for answers to that question. Astronomer Seth Shostak believes he'll know the sound of alien life 
when he hears it. We have a couple of, of observing projects to try and find signals. The biggest one are our radio searches, and that's where we use big arrays of antennas, and we point these antennas at nearby star systems that we think, well, this is the kind of star that might have a planet that might be something like Earth. We point in those directions, hoping to pick up a signal that would tell us that somebody there is clever enough to build a radio transmitter. It's a safari that never leaves home. Astronomers have also recently captured enough light from planets in distant solar systems to deduce their chemical makeup. They have found elements that may help form RNA, one of the building blocks of life here on Earth. And 20 light years away, in the constellation Libra, a team of European astronomers has found a planet that could be warm enough to have liquid water on its surface, just like Earth. Meanwhile, headed to the furthest reaches of our galaxy, a four spacecraft launched in the 1970s. Aboard two of them is a map of our solar system and the image of a man and a woman. Two others carry a sample of uranium whose rate of decay would date the probe, regardless of language. The two are also carrying what could be the most universal message of all, a recording that includes a composition by Bach. Just don't expect news anytime soon. These intergalactic postcards from the Earth will take 80,000 years to reach the nearest star. Our search for life beyond Earth has only just begun. There are billions of planets yet to be explored. Every one of them holds the tantalizing possibility of life. Even intelligent life. Just in the face of this enormity, the idea that we're the only game in town, is, it, it just doesn't seem reasonable. I think the question of whether we're alone is profoundly important for human beings in general. If you're aware, you really have to ask that question. Somewhere in a galaxy known or unknown, something or someone could be looking out into space, peering at the Milky Way and wondering, is there life out there?